You don't need a $4,000 computer to be writing documents. Or do Hello folks, and welcome to NetCruiser Tech. This is a 2018 MacBook Pro 15.6 inch model, and it's the mid-level one where it has the upgraded i7, 16 gigs of RAM, a 512 gig SSD, and a Radeon 560X video card. It's actually a pretty powerful machine. So this is uh, six cores, 12 threads, MacBook Pro that has the giant touchpad and the touch ID. And you also have the touch bar, which I'm gonna talk about a couple things about this laptop because as much as I wanted to like it and I bought it for an upgrade, it's another one where I just can't live with it. And I'm gonna go through why. The discrete graphics is a Radeon Pro 560X with four gigabytes of RAM. This is by far the most powerful MacBook computer I've ever owned. And again, I got it on an open box deal and it was going for $1,000 less than retail price and I just couldn't help myself. I had to try it. I've wanted to try one of these that had specs like this for a long time to see if it's worth it. And it is powerful, but that power comes at a downside and that is that this chassis just cannot dissipate the heat. It is so thin that it almost burns me. And you've likely noticed that to put a cover on all my MacBooks to protect from scratches on the aluminum, but it's also for comfort of using the machine because on these laptops, they get so warm that the aluminum heats up and then the aluminum transfers to your skin. And I use my laptop as a laptop a lot. I sit and I edit on my lap. I use a laptop as a laptop. How crazy is that? On the older machine, which I will show you in a couple of minutes, the airflow of the heat dissipates up through the top and in front of the screen. I mentioned that on a previous 13 inch MacBook Pro that I reviewed the 2017 model. This 2018 model actually does have two fans. So it does run quieter and it has some, some different airflow. Air intakes are along these slits here on the side. There's one on each end and that's where the air comes in but the air comes out of the back bottom, right under this little slit of the hinge. And there is so much hot air that comes out of there when it's working and it's blowing down instead of it blowing up because it has nowhere to go. When you open the lid, it can only blow down at you. And the, the heat that comes out of it is crazy. There's a reason why when these first came out and uh, the i9 version, David Lee, Dave2D, made a video, a very famous video of him running it in a freezer. Things have improved since then. Apple has changed the firmware and made them run cooler and quieter, but still, the amount of heat that this thing puts out is uncomfortable, and that's the primary reason why I'm not going to keep it. The other reason is because even with the discrete 560X video card, when I'm editing a certain type of video, it was still stuttering. The extra video horsepower was not giving me any improvements and I can show you a little demo of that. I'm gonna hook up an external hard drive and I'm gonna jump into iMovie and show you an example of what I mean. I've got my external SSD hooked up. This is a 250 gig SSD that I just made and put into a Seagate enclosure. Running through my USB A to C adapter so I can plug it into this machine because you only have USB C ports. Uh, but you do get four of them on this machine. I have no problems with that. And one thing of note is that the, uh, the dongles have gotten ridiculously cheap. Well, here's one that's uh, USB 3.0 SD card readers and uh, it was like $13 Canadian. I bought this in case I was going to keep this machine because you still do need to carry something like this with you so you can get an SD card especially if you work with video a lot. A lot of the videos that I shoot on are on Sony and Sony uses an AVC HD video profile. Here's an example of a video that was shot at 1080p in AVC HD and if I'm just going to uh, go up here and uh, I'm just going to mute the audio but I want to show you that the video is pl currently playing back. It'll buffer a little bit. Anyway, it's non-smooth playback. There's something going on where it taxes the CPU a lot. If I'm playing this back, if I open up my performance monitor here, well, it seems to have fixed itself now. Previously, I was getting a lot of CPU usage on here. I was getting all 12 cores spiking while just trying to play back a 1080p AVC HD video. It might have been rendering in the background, but it, but this was after I'd already made the video and it was all done, it was ready to upload. Now there's one thing that these laptops do do better, that's HEVC. So if you're running the newer HEVC cell video, part of the touch bar and touch ID chip is there's a separate 
T2 security chip that actually does HEVC encoding and that helps with video playback. So in this case, this is running okay, but if I jump into something like a 4K HEVC video, off of my GoPro, those run even better. This is a 4K clip, has no problems playing these back. My biggest complaint with this is that for the money, because these are three to $4,000 machines when you buy them in this spec, it is a lot of money. You're really still not getting the benefits out of that price point. The video card, the 560X, was not doing any boosted rendering for me. It was not doing anything better than what my current machine does, which is this, 2015 MacBook Pro right here. This one does not have a video card in it. It just has, well, I mean, it has the built-in onboard graphics and uh, I've been perfectly happy with this one actually, but it's a little heavy and it's a fourth gen CPU, uh, quad core, eight threads versus this one being a 2018 CPU, six core, 12 thread, much more powerful, should have been more efficient. I was expecting it to run cooler and quieter and run longer and uh, it just doesn't. I'm sorry to say, it just doesn't. So for the small improvements that we get here in form factor, this one's a little bit thinner, you get a bigger touchpad, you get the new style keyboard, which is actually a problem because these are these are unreliable, but they're warrantied for four years now. Uh, this one is the old style chiclet keyboard. The new one has the touch bar system. On a traditional laptop, you have these func function keys available all the time. And on the touch bar, when you're not using it for a while, it goes completely blank, as well as you get no tactile response response from the touch bar. Just a screen, so there is no physical click. We're running at 64 degrees at a 3147 fan RPM. I have adjusted that myself, set on my own fan profile. If I change it, it does run quieter, but it also runs quite a bit hotter. So it would probably be running at around 75 to 80 degrees C and you wouldn't be able to hear it on the default automatic fan profile. So I've changed it a bit so that it will, once I start video editing, it will run the fans before it gets too hot. And that's just because it was, it was really too uncomfortable to use as a laptop. And even with this fan profile, it still is. I'm still within my return period of this machine. And even though I got a deal on it, I do think I'm gonna send it back. Um, just because when I'm using it day to day, I'm not noticing a big enough improvement of using this one over the 2015. And the 2015 was already an upgrade over my old MacBook Air. And the things that you're getting when you jump from something like this to this form factor is you are getting a uh, P3 color gamut rated screen, uh, the newer chassis and the newer CPUs and the T2 security chip and the touch ID unlock and the, uh, and the touch bar. Now, when you're actually editing, the touch bar, you get very limited controls here of playback. And in iMovie, you only get one command that you can do, which is to split when you're uh, when you're scrubbing through. If you buy something like Final Cut Pro, then you would get more controls here, but there are some third-party utilities that you can get for your touch bar. And here's one of them. It's, uh, I think it's called Application Touch Bar. And this puts your dock in the touch bar. That's pretty cool. That's an application that I installed, which gives you the equivalent of your most recently used app. So instead of going down to your docking station, which I've mentioned in previous videos that a lot of people on Macs keep that on the screen all the time. And if you do, then you lose that as usable real estate on your screen. So I always prefer to use the full screen, buying a laptop at a premium price point that has a deeper display. So if you have your dock used all the time, I do recommend you hide it and then you can you run your windows full screen. And then if you have a new enough machine that has a touch bar, get the dock in your touch bar is called Touch Switcher. It's a free application and I do recommend that one. It's pretty useful. It does have some unique functionality, but it also is a little bit limiting and a little bit gimmicky. Absolutely, it's gimmicky. I have mine programmed so that I can bring up the little side menu in OS X Mojave, as well as there are some one-touch gestures. So instead of you clicking and then having to move your slider, you can just click and then slide without your finger being over it so you don't have to lift and click. That was, a, that was an update that Apple made to the touch bar just to make it a little bit more useful. But Tactile feedback, something that I mentioned is, uh, is you know, because it's a touch bar, you don't have the feeling of clicking a key. It's called haptic touch bar. So if I load this, I was just on the free trial of it and it shows up up in your taskbar here. And from this area, you can change the haptic intensity. By default, you have none. Normally on the touch bar, when you click a button, 
you feel absolutely nothing. It's completely dead. I'm getting a sound feedback. Normally you click on it, you hear nothing. If I turn up haptic feedback to its maximum, this is using the Taptic engine that's in this giant touchpad because it's also solid state and has the, uh, the linear actuator underneath it to give you the sense of a click. And it will fire that when you use the touch bar. So I actually like that. That is a third party piece of software that gives you a little bit of a hack and it has a bunch of configurations in it where you can choose if you want to have it when you're doing a lift or a tap or a lift. You can have it to vibrate when releasing the intensity as well as if you want it to use a sound effect when you're clicking. So you can have haptic and sound. I do like that tool. If I was gonna keep or own a MacBook in the future that continues to have the touch bar, I would I would keep both of these utilities, the, uh, the one that adds applications to it, as well as the one that adds a little bit of haptic feedback to it. But um, overall, I still do not think that these machines are worth the money. I have a particular problem with how that heat works on the older machines, 2012 to 2015s, all of the ventilation comes out here away from you. So I can I can easily use this one as a laptop without feeling like it's burning my legs off. I'm willing to wait a few more minutes during a render to be able to have a machine that I can use comfortably versus this one that feels like it's burning me. I am using these as video editing machines. If you're not pushing them that hard all the time, you're not gonna notice that. But, but if you're not pushing them that hard all the time, why are you buying a machine this expensive? You don't need a $4,000 computer to be writing documents. All right, the other thing I wanted to just show here is related to battery life. And I was kind of curious, this is something that I hadn't tested yet. And I looked to see how big this battery is. New 2018 machine is a 7,155 milliamp hour battery and it's had 16 cycle counts. This one I've also recently bought. Uh, it was also an open box uh, demo unit and I've been having a great time with it, but I just got drawn into the, oh, this one's a thousand dollars off retail. I got to try it. Nah, it's kind of, kind of was a letdown. As much as I want to have that many CPUs, it just wasn't pulling it off for me. Let me just do a quick system report on this guy. I'm gonna go into power. And, and yeah, the older machine has a bigger battery, 8,436 milliamp hour with 44 cycles on it. That makes a big difference. 8,436 versus 7,145. That means that this older machine has over 1,300 milliamp hour more battery capacity than this one. And it shows, you notice it when you're using it that this one drains less. Even though this one has a four generation newer CPU in it, this one lasts longer. And this one also does seem quicker to charge. So overall, after testing both these machines, a 2015 versus a 2018, I am choosing to return the 2018 and keep the 2015. Even though I'm losing out on some of the niceties of having the HEVC um, hardware encoding, because this, this CPU is too old to do that, it'll play back HEVC video, but it won't do it efficiently. And it does use about half of the CPU power of all cores uh, to be playing back high, high efficiency video codecs. Overall, that's just my overview of this machine. I needed to show you that before this goes back. I didn't want to miss the opportunity to show you that I did try a 2018 MacBook Pro and uh, I know it's just not for me. It did wow me initially. Uh, the very first day or two of using it, I really loved it. But then it started to heat up. It started to cause me some problems. It also crashed a couple times. There has been an issue where the, because it has a T2 security chip in it, it has to offload some, some information back and forth between main CPU to T2, and that can cause a kernel panic sometimes. So I did have a couple of weird crashes, a couple of weird bugs. That's been going on since these machines came out in like 2016 era, so not too happy about that. The other new unique thing about the 2018 and 2019 models is that you get a True Tone display. Now this is designed to look at the ambient outside colors of your environment and keep the display so it looks nice to you. It's a little buggy. I've had some weird issues where it's like pulses weird colors and stuff depending on where I'm sitting, especially maybe around fluorescent lights. I've noticed that, so I just decided to turn it off. I do notice that the screen goes a slightly more of a to a blue tone when you turn it off. The True Tone display gives you a warmer output, but it also varies depending on what the lighting conditions are and like when you calibrate a TV, I usually turn off the things that are gonna change on the fly because it will, it'll take you out of what you're doing. If you start to notice the white balance shift while you're working, 
it's a little distracting. There's also a couple other usability issues where you can no, you can no longer get a silent click on your force touch. This one's a 2015, so it also has a force touch trackpad, but it's a much more pleasant sound. They've changed the hardware in these, and this one makes that weird noise, and this one does not. In the older 2015 model, you still get all of your ports. So I've got a MagSafe port, two DisplayPort Thunderbolt 2 ports, a USB 3.0, a headphone in jack, and on this side we have SD card reader, HDMI, and another USB 3.0. And as I mentioned, these have better ventilation, expels the heat out and away from the user. All right, it's reset time. Hold down Command and R when it's time to reset a Mac, and it'll boot you into a restore mode. And it does take a long time though. You also want to make sure that you log out of iCloud before you ever sell off or return a machine. You got to log out of iCloud because if you return it to them iCloud locked, it's completely useless. It's it you cannot unbreak you cannot break that. So make sure that you've logged out of your account first. All right, guys. If you enjoyed this video, hit that like button. If you're new around here, subscribe. If you want to talk to me, leave a comment down below. And as always, thanks for watching. Thank <laughs> you.